live to Grantham in Lincolnshire now, where Conservative leadership candidate Rishi Sunak is speaking. Let's listen in. This leadership election will touch on many issues, and I will travel the length and breadth of our country to hear our members and tell them about my vision and how we need to change. But there is a core to this campaign that stands us apart, that represents the best of us in the most testing of times, and that is moral courage. It may seem trite to say it, but, that, but that's only because it is so rare in our politics, the moral courage to tell the truth, even if it hurts me, the moral courage to raise issues, even if they are uncomfortable, and the moral courage to rise above the smears and the hatred, no matter how baseless or unfair. We can be better, and we will be better. Now, this courage comes from my family, my mum, who ran the local chemist on Burgess Road in Southampton, and my dad, a local NHS GP. This country gave them the opportunity for a better life, and they took it. They had three children, me, my brother, and my sister. And they gave everything so that we could have more than they had. It is the most conservative of conservative stories, and one that everyone here would recognize. Now, my mum and dad are not here today, but my wife and children are. And whatever happens in this election, I've never been prouder to say to them, I love you all. Now, I've spent a few years in Westminster now and a couple of years at the top of government. And I can tell you, whilst it is full of decent and hardworking people, the system is broken. And no amount of undeliverable promises are going to change that. Since the start of this campaign, I've told you all some tough things to hear, but I've told you them because I'm a conservative. Conservatives don't believe in burdening future generations tomorrow because of weakness today. That is not who we are, and that is not who I am. No. We believe in other things. Conservatives believe in each other, because it is through each other, not the state or even the market, that we achieve the things that make life worth living. Conservatives believe in honesty, because the foundation of all freedom is truth. And above all, Conservatives believe in duty and fidelity. It is the core of our party and our people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> duty and fidelity to one another, to our families, those we love, to our neighbours and friends, to our word and to our country. These are Conservative values and they are my values. And as your Prime Minister, I will turn these values into action for you. Because the problems we face are so much more fundamental than any candidate in this election has told you. Enough is enough. I am here to tell you that unless we change, unless we are competent enough to grip this moment and make it work for our country, the challenges we face in the coming months alone will push us to the limit. This must not happen. The stakes are too high and the cost to our people too great. If we are to deliver on the promise of Brexit, then we're going to need someone who actually understands Brexit, believes in Brexit, voted for Brexit. And if our challenges are great, then our answers must be too. 
We have national emergencies that must be dealt with. And we have to tell the truth. We have to tell the truth about our NHS and the pressure it is under. I've taken a lot of political pain to make sure the NHS has what it needs, and I'm the candidate in this contest who can say unequivocally the NHS will be safe in my hands. We face the worst NHS winter crisis in decades. Tackling the backlogs is the biggest public service emergency. We need a fundamentally different approach. We will take the best of our COVID response and apply those lessons to clearing the massive backlogs in the NHS. We have to tell the truth about immigration because our system is still not working. It is simply unacceptable to have the current situation where criminal gangs are still trafficking illegal immigrants to this country, exploiting loopholes in the legal system, and yes, our compassion. We must never lose that compassion, but we must be tougher and we must be uncompromising. And as someone who is the product of immigration and the warm and welcoming embrace of this country, I know it can work, but only legally. We have to tell the truth on criminal justice and sentencing. Over half of all crimes are committed by just 9% of criminals. So if you want to deal with the crime, then any answer that doesn't target that group of people who are committing most of it isn't worth the paper it is written on. We have to tell the truth about our schools, where the great education reforms of Michael Gove have come under threat. So we must now again double down, not just on teacher quality and technology, but genuine reform of our curriculum. We have to tell the truth about national security. Yes, defence spending needs to increase. And I will never shortchange our armed forces, and my track record proves that, with the largest increases in defence spending since the Cold War. But simply saying 3% isn't a plan. It's an arbitrary target. Rather. We need to provide our military with the resources it needs to do what it needs to do to keep us safe. We have to tell the truth about the cost of living and that there is no answer to this problem other than to grip inflation and bring it down. Rising inflation. <laughs> Rising inflation is the enemy that makes everyone poorer and puts at risk your homes and your savings. And we have to tell the truth about tax. I will deliver more tax cuts. I've already made real progress as Chancellor, but I will not put money back in your pockets, knowing that rising inflation will only whip it straight back out. So we will tell the truth, no matter the cost, because there can be no real change without. But real change is there. I swear it. We can be better, but it will only come with radicalism. We can grow our economy creating more and better jobs with higher wages and real progression if we actually get businesses investing. So I'm going to reform our tax system and make this the best country in the world to invest. And it's not just about big businesses. This is about small businesses too. This is about our high streets. They can't grow if they can't invest, and I will fix that. We can revolutionise our education system, but only if we accept that the status quo is not only unacceptable, but immoral. I don't care where you're born or who your parents are. Your birthright should be a world-class education. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because today's education system is tomorrow's economy. And we can cut more taxes, 
but only if we defeat the enemy of inflation. And that can only happen if we are honest about the ravages it causes. We must see the danger in front of us and act, not pretend like it isn't happening. Or more dreadful still, make the situation worse, putting people's homes and savings at risk. I will deliver a lower tax economy. I will deliver tax cuts, but tax cuts you can believe in. I will make that happen. We must be radical. We must change, because if we don't, we can't rebuild our economy. We must be radical. We must change, because if we don't, then Brexit will not be safe. And we must be radical. We must change if we are to beat Keir Starmer and the Labour Party at the next election. Yeah. Because all the promises in the world mean nothing if the country wakes up to a Labour government in 2024. All the evidence is clear. I am the only person who can beat Labour. I am the only candidate who can protect the union. And I am the only candidate who can keep Brexit safe. To Today, my campaign with party members begins. My campaign will represent the very best of Conservative values. I will give everything to earn every vote. But be in no doubt, I am the underdog. The forces that be want this to be a coronation for the other candidate. But I think members want a choice, and they are prepared to listen. And in the coming days, they will see that I don't just offer change. I don't just offer grip. I'm offering hope. We can be better. Thank you. Ready for Ready for Ready for Thank you. Yes, you Thank you. Let me take some questions. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Now, I think we've got time for some questions, and I think there's some media over here somewhere, and then we'll take some questions from all of you as well. Right. Let's start with the media. Charlie, who have we got? Have we got a mic somewhere over there? Tony Rowe, BBC. Can I ask you a question? Perfect. Sorry. Uh, yes, do you want to say your name? Uh, you... Tony Rowe from uh, BBC. Hi, Tony. Um, is it a coincidence you've started your campaign in Margaret Thatcher's hometown? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm at, I'm, I'm at, well th there is that, but I'm also delighted to be here with my great friend, your local MP, Gareth. But he's a brilliant champion for this community. <laughs> so... Look, I think, you know, you, you, the broader point about your question is, yes, I do believe that what I'm proposing economically is what I would describe as common-sense Thatcherism. The number one economic challenge our country faces right now is inflation. And we must get a grip of inflation now and not risk making the problem worse. If we don't do that, we don't get a grip of it, it will cost families more in the long run. And I believe that that's what Margaret Thatcher would have done. Deal with the challenge of inflation first, get it out of the system, and then get on to delivering the tax cuts that we all want to see. Can I, can I one, more, can I one more question? Hi, Hi. Uh, It's Jane from Channel 4 News. Um, you talked about honesty, telling the truth about taxes. Um, so are you saying that Liz Truss is misleading party members, or is she lying when she says you can cut taxes without pushing up inflation? Well, I've been very clear as you just heard, that this is the most pressing challenge we face. And I do believe that it is the wrong approach for the government at this moment to be borrowing an extra tens and tens and tens of billions of pounds at a time when inflation is rising almost to double digits and interest rates are already on the rise. The risk of doing that is that you make the situation worse. Everyone who has a mortgage here and watching 
having to pay hundreds, if not thousands of pounds more because of the impact that it would have on interest rates. And beyond that, I also don't believe it's moral. I'm a conservative because I was brought up to believe that you pay or you earn what you need for your spending. That was how I was raised in my household with my family. I did my mum's books in her local chemist. I sat around our kitchen table doing the accounts every month. And that's what, of course, you need to do when you run your small business. And that is a deeply conservative value. And if we are not the party of sound money, I don't see what the point in the Conservative Party is. Is she just misguided or is she misleading? Well, I think you, you'll all make up your own views about that. I've, I've been very clear that not only do I think it's the wrong thing for the economy, I do also believe that it is immoral. Because there is nothing noble or good about racking up bills on the country's credit card that we then pass on to our children and our grandchildren. <laughs> I've got, right, I've got a gentleman here, yes. Are you going to visit Maggie's statue? Ah, oh, well. <laughs> I, I, well, I hope so too. I, if I've got time, we're going to have to nip over there afterwards. I will try and do it. But no, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, she was, she's rightly someone who we all look up to in our party for the change that she brought to this country. And as I said, economically, she was prepared to do some difficult things and do them first for the long-term benefit of our country. That's what I'm prepared to do, and I believe that that's what leadership is about. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, David Collins from the Sunday Times. Um, Hi, David. You just said about um, the powers that be don't want you to go kind of I mean, I was, I was talking g generically, but look, obviously I start this part of the contest uh, in uh, the underdog position. I was delighted that... Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> look, I was delighted in the parliamentary stage of this, I came top of the ballot. And if you think back a month or two ago, when people were speculating about this contest, if it would ever happen, I was written out of it. And thanks to the hard work and support of colleagues like Gareth, I came top of the ballot just a few weeks later, drawing on all the breadths and talents and wings of our parliamentary party. And I think what that demonstrates is that I can bring people together. And in the same way that I've done in our parliamentary party, I'm confident that I can do that in the country as well. So as I take out this message that I've spoken to you today about, this message of change, this message of radicalism, this message that we need to grip these emergencies facing our country and that I am the best person to do that, I'm confident that our members will see that, they will respond to it, and they will also recognise that I'm the person who can beat Keir Starmer when the next election comes. <laughs> Have we got? Yes. Oh. Um, Morning, ma'am. As you no doubt appreciate, Lincolnshire is mainly agricultural. And regarding this trade agreement with Australia, will you give us assurance that it will be debated in Parliament when you become Prime Minister? Yeah, well, you know, thank you, ma'am. That's an excellent question. And... We're here in Lincolnshire today, and hopefully tonight, if uh, my campaign team allow me, I might get to sleep in my own bed at home in North Yorkshire, and, yeah, which, which, like you all here, is a very agricultural community. A um, bit more hilly, uh, I think, and, but my, you know, my neighbour is a farmer. My entire community are farmers, and farming is something that's incredibly important to me. When I first came to Parliament, in spite of my business background, I rushed to get on the Agriculture and Farming Select Committee because I thought that supporting my community, my rural community, was absolutely vital in my role as a Member of Parliament. So I can reassure you that I will run the most pro-countryside, pro-farming government that you have ever seen. And you know what? If I don't, my own constituents won't re-elect me, let alone anyone else. <laughs> right, Johnny. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm Juliet Donoghue, former councillor of Rushcliffe Council, but also a nurse uh, that worked during the pandemic. And just for the press, particularly Channel 4, that he's not told me to say this, by the way. Thank you for what you did in the pandemic, all your hard work. We were the lead in Europe. Uh, we never lacked the lead. That was a lot of media. Um, we never lacked anything. And the procurement you did in a global crisis was astounding and just thank you so much for all your hard work and also uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson 
Because what people don't see is in public service, the work you put in, and you don't do it for the money because you're not that well paid. Thanks. You do it because you care about your communities. And I just wanted to thank you and all this negativity about the pandemic. I have no criticism and I felt we were in a safe pair of hands um, in the UK under the government. So thank you particularly. Oh, thank you. Julia, that's very, very kind of you to say thank you for that. And you know, can I can I just pay an enormous tribute to you and all of your colleagues for what you did? I mean, we saw the best of this country over the last two years. I, I don't know, you'll think back to that first press conference that I gave when I was introduced to you as your new chancellor, and I talked at the beginning of it all about the small acts of kindness that would be done by us and to us by millions of people. And that's what we saw over the past couple of years. Uh, but it started with the heroic efforts of you and your colleagues in the health service. Healthcare is so important to me. As I said, my mum was a local chemist. My dad was an NHS GP. I grew up working in her shop, delivering medicines to her patients. And like you, I saw the unbelievable impact on a community that good healthcare can provide and good people can provide. That's my inspiration for wanting to be a member of parliament. And it's my parents' story that has inspired me to be here, wanting to be your prime minister next. But let me just ask everyone to join me in saying thank you to you and all your colleagues yeah. for everything. Yeah. We've got quick questions galore. Sir, go on, sir, here in the front, and then we'll... Yeah, well, that's look, an absolutely excellent question. Now, China poses a threat to our security. It poses a threat particularly to our economic security, but thereby our national security. It's an authoritarian regime with values that are different to ours. And as Prime Minister, I would be robust in standing up for the values that we believe in and protecting us against the threat that China poses to our security. Specifically, there was a speech that the heads of the FBI and MI5 gave very recently, jointly, about the threat that China posed. And I thought that was an excellent speech, and that is the approach that I would follow as Prime Minister. But it requires us to think differently, because the threats that we face have changed. You know, if you find companies that we don't know where they're from trying to infiltrate our universities, our civic society, buying up the best technology that we're creating out of our universities, those are new 21st century threats and we must guard against them. And I will tell you as your Prime Minister, have every confidence that's exactly what I will do. We've got time for another one. Yes, go on, sir. Phil Stevens, uh, Middle England. <laughs> Not a question, just a bit of advice. A lot of your MPs were put in place by, I'd say, the, the ship is out and the forest. Not necessarily that they had a, a good campaign and uh, uh, kissed a lot of babies in the hall, but because of him. On that note, who's trying to distance themselves more from Boris, you or Mr. Trust? All right, Phil. Well, we, do either, yeah, no. Well, actually, you know, the, the, that's a very good point. When you were talking about those MPs, you definitely were not talking about your local MP, Gareth, who is absolutely exceptional. And now, so, I, I've been very clear and open about my views about the Prime Minister. I've said he's one of the most remarkable people that I've ever met, and it was a great privilege to serve in his government for almost two and a half years and to ex enjoy some extraordinary successes that we shouldn't forget. There was no other person, I believe, who three years ago could have broken that Brexit deadlock, got that done. You remember the paralysis our country was facing at the time. He alone was able to break that. He alone was able to deliver that election victory. And it's because of him that we managed to successfully roll out the vaccine, support the country through the pandemic, as we heard from Juliet, but then also to stand up to Ukraine first and before others. And he deserves enormous credit from those things. And I'm not, I'm not going to rewrite history uh, and pretend that those aren't wonderful things. But for me personally, it got to a point where enough was enough. And I felt I had to leave from government. That wasn't an easy decision. It wasn't uh, a happy decision. But now, at this point, 
we have to look forward. The choice now for all our members is who is the best person to lead this country through the challenges we face. You heard a little bit from me today about those emergencies that we face, whether it's tackling illegal migration, whether it's tackling the backlogs in the NHS, whether it's getting a grip of inflation and rebuilding the economy so that we can cut taxes, whether it's keeping Brexit safe and realising all the opportunities. I'm the person who can best do that. And crucially, I am the best person that when the time comes, can beat Keir Starmer and deliver a historic fifth election victory for the Conservative Party. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much.